Hello everybody, Thersites the Historian here, and I'm continuing my examination of neutral powers in World War II. Today we're shifting the focus over to Turkey in the east, and I'm going to look at the context of Turkey, talk about the leadership, and also look at the reasons why they stayed neutral, and how Turkish neutrality, because of the circumstances, ended up functioning a lot differently than the neutrality of the Swiss or the Portuguese, or as we'll see later, the Irish. So without further ado, let's jump in and talk about Turkey's role in World War II. One major similarity that I've noticed between all the countries of World War II, whether they participated actively in the fighting or not, is that almost all of them had a central key leader who got them through the war and really guided their policy. Turkey was no different. However, it's not the man pictured on your screen. Kemal Ataturk was the founder of Turkey, more or less, but he was dead in 1938, and he actually left the state in the hands of one of his protégés, and we'll talk about him in just a second. Ismet Anunu is a virtual unknown outside of Turkey. However, he was tremendously important to Turkey during the war, and by extension, he was a major, if unrecognized, player in the politics of the 1940s, and actually even until his death, I believe, in the early 70s. Um, Anunu had a long and varied career. He started out in the service of the Ottoman army and ended up as the president of an independent Turkey. So let's go through his career, and I think it will help illustrate why he did what he did during World War II. When he was still Ismet Pasha, he was the commander of the Turkish army at the Battle of Megiddo in 1918. Famously, the British won that battle, and here you see the Turkish prisoners of war being gathered up and taken away. So you might think that Ismet Pasha's career would be over. He was a failed general in the service of an empire that was on the verge of collapse. However, that was obviously not the case. After the Battle of Megiddo, Ismet Pasha went back to Constantinople where he served as a military advisor until the downfall of the Ottoman regime. At that time, as the Ottoman Empire was crumbling, Greece, Turkey's neighbor and longtime rival, capitalized by occupying parts of the coast that they claimed were rightfully and ancestrally Greek. Um, Anunu sided with Ataturk and the other Turkish leaders who were trying to assert Turkey's independence and maintain its territorial integrity. And during the Turkish War of Independence, he fought two battles, two major battles at Anunu against the Greeks. Both battles were pretty much bloody draws, but the second battle actually has the distinction of being the first time a formally organized Turkish standing army in the post-Ottoman period had fought a battle. And because of his role, when Ataturk later assigned people family names, um, Ismet chose the name Anunu since that's what he was most famous for and most proud of in his life. And it was also his political claim to relevance in this new Turkey. In 1938, when Ataturk died, he was succeeded by Anunu and Anunu had a great deal of legitimacy going in, so there was really no great disruption when the great national founder died. And Anunu, in addition, was surrounded by other Ataturk men who had been around for a while, and they all had very similar ideas on how they wanted to approach any major European conflict. And the basic idea was something laid out by Ataturk, who basically said that Turkey needed to stay involved in affairs, keep talking to people, making deals, etc., but not commit to any kind of conflict beyond its own borders because he didn't think that they were materially able to win such a conflict. And this is a strategy that Anunu and his ministers carried out to perfection. In December of 1943, Time magazine ran a story featuring this graphic where it shows that Turkey is more or less surrounded on all sides by hostile powers. Um, now for the Turks, they feared the Germans and the Soviets, and they weren't terribly concerned about the ambitions of the Allies at this point. Um, one Turkish diplomat told someone that his dream is as follows. What we would really like would be for the Germans to destroy the Russians and for the Allies to destroy Germany. Then we'd feel safe. Basically, Turkey had had a long, um, centuries-long 
conflict with the Russians that had only ended after World War One, when the old regimes in both countries had collapsed, but there was still a lot of distrust there, and they still shared a mutual border, and it was uncomfortable. And at the same time, just like most people in Europe and throughout the world, they were very leery of Hitler's Germany, so they definitely didn't want to see that regime gain any more power. So Turkey had to walk a tight rope, and they wanted to sort of help the Allies a little bit, but they didn't want to commit in a way which would bring on the wrath of either Germany or the Soviet Union. Turkey's initial plan when the war broke out in 1939 was to be neutral but pro-British, and there were a couple events that made them try to attack more towards the middle. One was the Molotov-Ribbentrop uh, Pact, the non-aggression pact between the USSR and Germany. Um, Without the two powers being engaged with each other, that meant that either one was potentially free to campaign against Turkey, which would have been a complete catastrophe for Anunu and Turkey. And the second thing that happened was when France fell, it turned out that um, the Germans were able to uncover the British plans for Operation Pike, which was an operation where the Turks would allow the British to fly bombers from Turkey into Russian territory and destroy oil fields. So this created a lot of tension with both Germany and the Soviet Union. So to alleviate that tension, Anunu was forced to, you know, talk kindly to the Russians and also to make a trade agreement with Germany that gave them a lot more economic ties than he would have liked. However, he did manage to prevent himself from being drawn any deeper into an alliance or friendship with Germany, and he slowly started to work his way back towards uh, being pro-allied over time. Most Turkish diplomacy was directed towards fobbing off the interest of the Germans and the Soviets. However, the Turks also had to politely decline many offers from the Allies, including a lot of harebrained schemes from Winston Churchill. Now, for his part, FDR by 1943 ceased to ask the Turks to participate in combat because their diplomats had succeeded in convincing him that the Turkish army was not ready for action, and we'll look into that later. Um, as for Churchill, though, he never really gave up on grandiose schemes, and he continued to press the Turks, and he more or less wanted to use them simply as a chess piece to take hits while the British landed in the Balkans, and liberated territory to prevent it from going into Soviet hands. However, the Turks had no interest in doing that because they were really dedicated to staying on Ataturk's plan, and it's probably a very good idea for them that they were smart enough not to listen to Winston Churchill, because now let's take a look at the state of their army during the 1940s. When I was trying to do a little bit of research to find images and details about the Turkish army from the World War II period, Almost 95% of what I found was about World War I. So I think that in itself is a pretty damning sign about the state of the Turkish army during that period. Very few photos were taken, and almost no one in the sort of uh, you know recreational military knowledge community has any interest in the Turkish army from this period. The only blog posts I've found are from people really complaining about the lack of information. So I think it's safe to say that uh, we're looking at an army that is not terribly well equipped. When the Turks would make deals with the Axis and Allies to sell them precious war materials, a lot of those deals included things like getting technical assistance and getting teams of engineers in place to build infrastructure. They also would get certain amounts of tanks or other modern military equipment that they clearly weren't able to produce on their own. So the Turkish army was effectively a World War I army that was existing in the 1940s. Had they actually fought a battle, they probably would not have performed very well simply because they did not have the tools for the job. That being said, quantity is its own quality and Turkey had the largest of the neutral armies. Turkey could field 800,000 infantry equipped in 50 different divisions, and since Turkey's borders with any of its potential hostile neighbors would have been fairly narrow, 
they might have been able to put up a better fight than perhaps um, is apparent from the way that they're equipped. Certainly we know the Turks fought very hard in World War I and again in Korea when contingents of Turkish soldiers were sent there. So I don't want to rule out the possibility that the Turkish army could have performed well. I simply want to point out that without that kind of equipment, they could not have mounted a credible offensive. I would also like to propose that there is an additional military and diplomatic factor at play when it came to the calculations made by both the Turks, their allies, and their potential enemies, and that is the ghost of Gallipoli. The fact that the Turks were able to defend against a technologically superior British invasion force in 1915 was something that most policymakers in Europe would have been well aware of. If we think about Turkey's role in World War I, in retrospect, we think about Gallipoli and not a hell of a lot of else. So I think that this is something which would have really played into people's minds. Okay, so the Turks don't have the most advanced force, but they can really drag out a war and make it brutal and long and unprofitable. So it's best not to attack the Turks unless you have to, and the Turks never antagonized anyone during World War II, so there was really no reason to invade them. So I think that just that little bit of deterrent was enough to keep a lot of potential enemies at bay and also gave Turkey more leverage than it would have had otherwise. Um, if they had didn't have this reputation, then maybe the Germans would have been a lot more successful at bullying them into a closer alignment with the Axis powers, for instance. During the war, the Turkish capital at Ankara was a hotbed of diplomatic activity with the you know mandatory espionage thrown in. All neutral capitals had a lot of espionage going on. Um, Ankara had a really brilliant social scene for all of these diplomats, so it was a great place to be stationed if you were a foreign diplomat. There were a lot of um, soirees and parties and things to attend, and Anunu and his ministers did a good job of courting and really, you know, trying to impress all of these foreign dignitaries. So um, it would have been a pretty good place to be if you could have chosen a place to get assigned. Although, you know, obviously it would have also been frustrating since the Turks had no intention of being anyone's fool and they would wine you and dine you, but then never agreed anything. The diplomatic skill of Turkey's leadership also benefited the city of Istanbul. Since all three belligerent sides in the Turkish eyes, meaning the Soviets, the Germans, and the Western Allies, needed to use the Straits of Dardanelles and the port at Istanbul to move around material, the Turks made this port available to everybody for a fee. So they were able to conduct trade like normal, and if anything, they probably made more money than normal. And as I said earlier, they were charging full price to everyone, and because they handled the diplomatic uh, negotiations of it so well, no one really complained that much, and Turkey was able to make quite a bit of money and also get the belligerent powers to spend their own resources helping Turkey to develop its infrastructure. So Turkey came out of the war as a much more developed and wealthy nation than when the war started. By 1944, however, the Allies began to exert more and more pressure on Turkey to enter the war and declare against Germany. And this was mostly driven by war weariness in Britain and Russia, and also the intransigence of Winston Churchill, who was determined that everyone should share in this sacrifice against the Germans. Um, the Allies more or less threatened economic ruin on Turkey, and they threatened to more or less just leave them out to dry and, you know, facing a Russia with a huge, de you know, mobilized army. So uh, the Turks eventually relented, and five days before the Allied deadline on February 23, 1945, uh, the Turks formally declared war on Germany. And this was, of course, well after the point where Germany could do any potential harm to Turkey. In fact, um, probably by about August of 1944, the German front was too far away from Turkish territory for even German aircraft to hit Turkey. So they could have declared then, but they didn't. Um, so I think that Turkey really played this war about as well as you could have as an underdeveloped country 
you you did not get involved. You didn't lose a single life. There was no territorial destruction, and you were able to sell vital resources and get your country developed um, along the way. And then at the end of the war, they managed to enter late. And what that did was give them just enough credibility in the eyes of the Allies, especially the Americans, who by this point were much more important than the British. And that gave them enough uh, protection from the Soviet Union that Turkey was never seriously threatened or overrun during the Cold War. So I really have no major criticisms of what Turkey did during World War II. I think they played their hand perfectly. And it's hard for me to think of someone who got more out of the war um, by giving less. So hats off to Turkey. And we'll come back at a later date and talk about Ireland and Sweden before we wrap up this series.